Hello everyone, I'm here with Matt again, and uh, <laughs> we're outside, so please forgive the background noise and stuff, we'll do the best we can with that, but hopefully what we're looking at here is interesting enough to sort of put up with all of that interruption and stuff in the background. What we're going to run through here is, well what Matt's going to run through here, because I know really very little about <laughs> this kit at all, is North Vietnamese regular army mm -hmm. uniform basically, from sort of the late Vietnam War era. 1970s basically. Yeah, late 60s. Early late, late 60s, up to early the 70s, up to the end of the, the Vietnam War, uh, the, uh, well, the, uh, the capture of Saigon. So take it away Matt, obviously sure. you're, you're, work, you're basically operating as a living mannequin Absolutely, here. Absolutely, yeah. Matt obviously Absolutely. is not Vietnamese, <laughs> but nevertheless modelling the, the uniform here for sort of the ease of talking through all the bits and pieces, so please carry on Matt. Sure, uh, okay, so uh, I'm, as Simon says, I'm PAVN Infantry, late 60s, early 70s, up to the end of the war. Uh, this is the standard uh, North Vietnamese Army, or PAVN, People's Army of Vietnam, uh, infantry uniform from that period. Uh, as you can say, green, fairly simple uh, shirt, somewhere under here, or under all this webbing, and trousers. Uh, it's similar in cut, the shirt in particular is similar in cut to the Chinese uh, Type 65 tunic, which, uh, as you might notice, is worn tucked in, as opposed to Chinese tunic, which is worn untucked, because it's based on the Zhongshan suit, which is uh, uh, important to the Chinese for a whole host of cultural reasons. Uh, and obviously the Vietnamese, it wasn't, so it's one tucked in. It has two chest pockets, uh, little buttons on them, button up down the front, uh, quite large buttons. These are plastic, but quite poorly uh, molded, quite a lot of flash on them for those of you who do model kits, uh, mass manufactured. Uh, a lot of the Vietnamese uniforms were made in China. Uh, the Vietnamese had a clothing industry, but it wasn't really up to the standards of supplying an entire army with absolutely everything it needed, especially since it was being uh, routinely and quite vigorously bombed by the Americans. Uh, the trousers are a little bit different than Chinese ones. These are all rolled up here, uh, as they often were. They have a, if you can see, small fastening at the bottom. There's a button on the other side, so they can be wrapped around the leg and buttoned shut, so you don't need to wear putties or gaiters or anything to stop uh, creepy crawlies climbing up trouser legs in the jungle, or water travelling too far up there, or them getting caught on uh, brush, undergrowth. Uh, that's that's the basic uniform. Uh, this is was worn year-round. There was, early in the war, the Americans, the Allied intelligence, assumed that the Vietnamese had two types of uniform, what was known as a wet season and a dry season uniform. This green one, this sort of sage green, was uh, classified as the wet season uniform, which makes sense. Vietnam is extremely verdant, and especially during the rainy season, all the, the plants are out of the jungle foliage. Uh, the dry season uniform was uh, one of a variety of shades of beige, or a sort of stone, stone grey, off-white colour. Um, that was actually early production uniforms that were dyed in pretty poor quality dye and tended to fade very, very badly. The Vietnamese eventually standardised on the green uniform and you might occasionally see the stone coloured uniform, the, the dry season uniform uh, in service with the, the Viet Cong in the south, as they were just handed off. And that literally became a, a, a lighter colour because of the poor quality sure, of the dye, yeah, it the, just faded. The sunlight, the dye, the, the rain, the damp, the sweat of the soldiers, it, it, it faded. But um, colour wasn't particularly uniform, particularly in the early parts of the war. So within that dry and wet season, you'd have varying shades of green. You might notice the, the trousers and the tunic are a little bit different. That comes down to manufacturing and just uh, quality control issues. They needed lots of uniforms fast. They weren't really that concerned about having perfectly matching uniforms. And of course, as soldiers went through kit, they'd, just, they'd, break, they'd ruin trousers, they'd rip shirts, whatever had happened, they'd have to swap and change. So uniform differences, even right at the end of the war, uh, different shades of green are quite common. But within that dry season and wet season, you'd have all sorts of colours of gear. This is more prevalent amongst main force Viet Cong, who were the semi-standing force in the south of southern guerrillas controlled by the north. So you see beiges, browns, sometimes a, an almost sort of rusty coloured brown. Uh, you occasionally see purple, or you hear reports of purple, and that's believed to have been wet brown clothing. They didn't actually have purple uniforms. That would have been strange. very strange. Yes. Um, black was sometimes seen, but again, that was more of a VC thing. For the north, generally speaking, it was this green or the, the dry season sandy co uh, stony coloured. Uh, the footwear is the Zeplop sandals. These are made out of car tyres with car inch tubes as the top straps. Uh, quite comfortable. These were issued to the soldiers in addition to a pair of uh, canvas topped, uh, rubber lowered liberation shoes. They were virtual copies of the Chinese liberation shoe which had been in service since the 50s, since the Korean War. 
uh, almost like a pair of Converse, really. Yeah, they, they really boots? are. Yeah, especially yeah. the high tops. There's low tops and high tops. The low tops, uh, for those of you of a certain age, uh, are like plimsolls that you wore at school for doing PE. Um, like Simon says, the, yeah. the taller ones, the boot type, which the Vietnamese favoured and which were produced in huge quantities in China for the Vietnamese, are high tops. Comes up to you about your ankle, a little bit more protection. Very similar to Converse. High yeah, tops very in, similar in, to in high the tops. Looks, yeah. Absolutely no ankle support, they're very light and they're, they're pretty comfortable, but in a jungle environment they are terrible. They have a canvas upper so water gets in really easily, but then the, the entire lower part of the shoe and the sole is rubber. It's two separate pieces, but it's all rubber. So any water that gets in doesn't get back out, except a minor amount through evaporation, I suppose. But you end up with all sorts of horrible uh, foot problems in a humid jungle environment. So although they were issued the boots, the boots were not universally used, even though these sandals were supposed to be for, for barracks wear, for off-duty wear. Uh, you would very routinely see these shoes, these sandals in combat, uh, for marching through the jungle, for wading through uh, water, watery areas, rice paddies, rivers, streams, that sort of thing. Um, fairly ubiquitous, they, they were cheap to make, easy to repair if they did break or replace, um, very very popular and used throughout the war. Um, sometimes saw them worn with socks as well, which is, is not a great look, I've got to say. Uh, I decided not to do that, you know, um, have some taste. So that just about covers the uniform. Uh, I think moving on to the equipment, we have, some of you have probably noticed it already, a Chinese Qi Kong chest trick. Uh, this is an a five cell version with three magazine pouches and two smaller pouches. These are ostensibly for grenades but could also be used to carry field dressings, uh, cleaning tools, boilers, small personal effects, compasses, things like that. Uh, this is currently empty, it would have been a bit bulky if it had the magazines in and each pouch holds one magazine. You can sort of force two in but it's not really recommended, it strains the design. These were manufactured in absolutely vast quantities by the Chinese to go along with the Type 56 assault rifle, the Type 56 AK which was a standard Vietnamese assault rifle. Uh, they were in, inherited in huge numbers, also brought in in huge numbers from China, uh, along with lesser quantities of Soviet-made AK-47s and later on in the war AKMs, uh, as well as Eastern Bloc AKs of various types, uh, Romanian PM60, I think it's PM63s appear later on, uh, as well as AMDs from Hungary. Um, yeah, that's the, the chest rig, that's all the ammunition you carry normally, there's the three magazines. Uh, and whatever was in the side pouches. Over that, on my left hip, we have a grenade carrier. This is similar to Chinese construction, but it's actually a Vietnamese made item. It's slightly different. It's got small cups for holding the heads of the grenades, a strap that goes across the front and holds the grenades, also forms a waist strap to stop it flapping around when you're moving. Normally these would be worn under the chest rig, but not universally. Uh, it can hold four grenades, but I've only got three in here. The grenades I've got loaded are Type 67s inert type 67s um, which were Chinese made and as the name implies were made from the late 60s onwards based on grenades the Chinese had used during the Second World War which were ultimately copies of M24 steel hand grenades Granata uh, that inherited from Germany in the 30s, 20s and the 30s when the Germans were advising them um, the Vietnamese didn't standardize on the type of grenade they would use anything that exploded as a grenade uh, routinely cast their own uh, more likely you would see hand cast grenades with very crude cast iron heads, uh, stick handles of varying length. You would sometimes see ones that barely come to there or maybe even shorter. A uh, whole range of castings were made, they were of varying quality, the explosive loads were of varying uh, power and quality so they weren't always ideal but there was lots of them and they were used in huge quantities during assault operations or for setting traps and all sorts of things like that. Um, so that's, that's the grenades they carried on that hip. Just behind that, underneath the backpack, if you can see, is a small rubberized fabric pouch. That's a medical pouch. It normally holds field dressings. It has one in there. So that would hold several of those normally. Um, they were carried sometimes, they weren't always carried. There isn't a really set belt load for PABN forces. Whatever was to hand, whatever was needed. Uh, at very minimum, there was a canteen worn on the, the belt. I should mention the belt, which is just visible here under the chest rib, which is sitting a little low, um, is made of artificial leather. It's, it's rubberized. It's, it's called Leatheroid, I believe, Chinese manufacture. Uh, and I've got the belt upside down. Uh, it's got a star on the buckle, a silver belt buckle there. Uh, underneath that, you'll see the trouser belt. Again, Leatheroid material. It's got a friction buckle on it, a little silver buckle. They were sometimes embossed with stars, but not always. Uh, 
we were saying the leatheroid is similar to sort of a rubber hose material yeah. with cloth yeah, and absolutely. cloth in it. Yeah. Uh, similar to the, the East, for those who are familiar with East German kit, it, the, the later rubber ice straps used on the salt pack. Yeah. Similar material. Yeah. It's it's far better than leather for the jungle, which tends to rot, as the Americans and previous to them, the French found out rather quickly when they arrived. Um, yeah, got trouser belt, waist belt, on the waist belt, on the right hip, it's a canteen. The AVN used huge quantities of different canteens. Uh, they had home manufactured ones, which are made out of a, a strange sort of semi translucent plastic, semi, -tra semi transparent plastic tends to age very badly and goes very brown or yellow. Um, or they use the Type 65 Chinese canteen, little tin canteen with a Bakelite lid, carried over the shoulder again in its own little carrier. They use Captain American canteens or Arvin canteens, or they have their own, uh, again, Chinese made canteen in a locally made carrier, which fastens over underneath here, inside here on the canteen is a tin cup, which you would not find with the Chinese canteens, but the Chinese made canteens for the Vietnamese did have the little aluminium cup. So that goes there. Other than that, there's nothing on the belt. Uh, you very often see fighting knives, either captured American stocks, or allied stocks I should say, or quite commonly locally made knives. The Vietnamese made quite a lot of knives, often from downed aircraft. The aluminium that was salvaged uh, would make reasonable knives, or the steel that was salvaged, I should say. Sometimes the aluminium, but that was mostly used for other items. Um, either some of them were really quite crude with insulation tape bound handles, some had really nicely made wooden scales, that were fastened on with screws and had proper hand guards. They vary in quality and they were mostly either sort of village workshop made or personally made or bought in from small production rooms. They weren't standardised. Just very briefly going back to the canteen, Matt, sure. the point I find, I find interesting is the fact things were being made in China mm. but to, essentially to North Vietnamese contracts. Absolutely. So they are made to a North Vietnamese pattern but made in China. Made in China. They're not yeah. just receiving Chinese no. items. There's some of that. Yeah but they are actually having things made Contract specifically built. to their Absolutely. requirements, Absolutely. which is quite interesting and not something I was aware of. I no, always no. assumed that it was just Chinese military designs being provided. Well, you know, we're providing this, so yeah. you'll take what you're given. Take but it's interesting yeah. to know that they did have some input on yeah. what they were receiving. It's, it's, it's quite interesting, really, because given the, the breakdown in Sino-Vietnamese relations a few years afterwards, mm. that they were so closely tied, and there's huge amounts of Chinese propaganda in support of Vietnam during yes. the war. Uh, it's really fantastic pieces, really nice artwork, but in support of Vietnam. Um, so yeah, like Simon says, there was contract stuff. This canteen is contract. The uniform is contract. It wasn't that the Vietnamese didn't make their own stuff. It's just they, they lacked the capacity to to meet their army's demands. Uh, so we've done the canteen. We've done the grenades, the belt, the the webbing. So uh, I should probably mention the backpack, which I until now had on my back. This is a uh, Vietnamese, probably Vietnamese manufacturer, although some were made in China. Uh, it seems the Vietnamese made quite a lot more of these than they did of other equipment for some reason. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why. But these saw use throughout the war and even past the end of the war in the incursions in Cambodia and Laos and the wars there. Uh, it's a large main pocket with a drawstring. You can just sort of see there. Uh, it goes through several eyelets and can just be pulled tight. It's one continuous piece of cloth uh, tied together. Um, the three pockets on the outside, one on each side, and a large central one, which holds, you can just unbuckle this, it's got little slidey buckles. It's made out of quite heavy canvas, which is unusual, because a lot of Vietnamese equipment is quite light, light fabric, which is what you'd want in an incredibly hot and humid climate like Vietnam. Uh, this is quite heavy, as I say. Inside there is the standard North Vietnamese mess tin. Uh, this is patterned after the Chinese ones, but it's ever, uh, sorry, the French ones, but it's ever so slightly smaller. Uh, it's, it fits perfectly in that central pouch, which the French ones wouldn't, because the French ones are slightly larger. It's interesting to see the French influence again in the, in the mess kit that was used and, and issued and yeah. slightly redesigned. Slightly but redesigned, but huge quantities were left after the, the French left, after the French Indochina War. The Vietnamese repurposed those for a while and then altered them and made their own. These weren't ubiquitous. Again, not all soldiers would have had these. Everybody was issued a small rice bowl and sometimes a plate as well as chopsticks, a soup spoon, and various little bits of small cutlery. Uh, fairly simple. It's got a, a small tray inside. The lid obviously has a handle that folds out, so you can, you can use a little, little pan. Um, I think my favourite part of it is the handle. I don't know if you can see it very well on the camera. There's a tiny little piece of metal that slides backwards and forwards, and it locks into the hinge on the side. It stops the handle moving too much, because otherwise if you're carrying it with food in it, hot food in it, and that's disengaged, it has a habit of tilting over, it could spill, it could burn you. Uh, also good for if you wanted to put it over a fire, you could get a handle yeah. fixed in position, you can hang fixed it and it won't... And uh, Ideal. So that's that. Um, inside the backpack, unfortunately, I don't have a full backpack load. I would really like one one day. 
Um, but inside the backpack was, was all sorts of equipment. Generally a ground sheet or a tarp for putting between trees as a bit of shelter. Uh, a mosquito net, which is absolutely vital in Vietnam. Being a jungle country, a mixture of jungle and swamp, we've got huge amounts of biting insects, carry all sorts of diseases. Uh, they would also have a hammock, which would be, as I say, hung between trees or other terrain features, and that would be your sleeping uh, position for the night. Uh, you would also have a wash bag, generally a small uh, drawstring bag in which was combs, which was sometimes made from aircraft aluminium, as I mentioned. Uh, quite a lot of souvenir items were made like that, as little, little trophies, little sort of morale boosters for the troops from people at home. Uh, you'd also have brushes, toothbrushes, uh, mirrors, shaving kits, and razors, toothpaste, cl cleaning stuff, so that sort of thing. Um, small amounts of food would be carried, either captured or scavenged American or Arvan rations, or Chinese or North Vietnamese made tin food. F uh, fish was really quite popular, as it was fairly plentiful and fairly easy to make. Pork was also used, uh, beef, uh, chicken, uh, small tin cans. Um, Rice would be carried, if it was carried, in a, a large external carrier, which is just a tube that ties off at both ends, and that was known as the elephant's trunk sometimes, because it, it sort of resembles one when it's filled up. There'll be a further video after this looking at a Viet Cong uniform yeah, on a mannequin, sure, it, and, and that includes an example yeah. of one of those, so yes, yeah, so um, keep an eye out for that. <laughs> otherwise, uh, spare change clothes, uh, underwear, spare shirts, uh, whichever footwear wasn't being used, so either the sandals or the boots would be stored in the backpack. Um, I should mention the little rice balls have their own little carriers, little canvas carry with a drawstring and that fits on the it's usually, usually hooked over somewhere on the outside of the backpack to fill up a little bit of space inside uh, also personal effects uh, spare ammunition uh, tools anything that, was, that wouldn't fit anywhere else would be carried in the backpack um, sometimes you even find little red books Maoist little red books carried in there uh, it should be noted the Vietnamese didn't wholly adopt Maoist doctrine politically but were really big on Mao's angle on warfare uh, the entirety of North Vietnamese society was heavily militarised. People would either deputise into militia or would join, you know, civil defence groups or would be in the army. Most males were conscripted into the army. Uh, so that's the backpack. Last two things to mention, I think, are the neck scarf, which is a piece of Mitchell uh, parachute silk. These were scavenged from uh, shelter halves, tents, perhaps to say parachutes or other uh, pieces of equipment and were cut down. They were sometimes cut into large squares and were tied across the shoulders as a cape which would also cover the top of the backpack. They were seen mostly during the early war, by later on in the war they'd sort of been abandoned. Uh, or as here they were worn around the neck as a bit of a scarf, a bit of a sweat rag to stop your uniform getting too soaked. Uh, the hat is a uh, Vietnamese made boonie hat. It's different from uh, western types, a little bit more rounded on the crown and this, this is known as the sometimes referred to as the flower type because the brim if you notice is quite soft and quite thin uh, when they get wet when they get worn a little bit they have a tendency to form a very distinctive sort of wavy undulating pattern that sort of looks like a flower from certain angles it looks like petals or yeah petals on a flower so this can be worn obviously on the head or it's got a, a neck strap so you can carry it on your back if you don't need to wear it i should note that combat helmets in vietnam weren't really a thing they did have the uh the pith helmet which i think is called a uh, non coy Vietnamese again sorry for, sorry for the pronunciation uh, it's made of compressed card it looks like a like a pith helmet um, they were absolutely ubiquitous every soldier had one uh, they offered no physical protection they're not particularly comfortable but they are really good at keeping the weather off you uh, they hold off water very well uh, great for keeping the sun off because they cover a bit of your shoulders and the back of your neck uh, they were not particularly popular during vigorous activity obviously having quite a broad brim if you were crawling or climbing or doing anything involved looking up they had a tendency to catch on the back of the neck and push forward over the eyes uh, but they were they were ubiquitous and even today they still exist in north vietnam as a bit of a sort of uh, a sort of worker's hat anybody who's outdoors particularly in the cities in the north wears them to keep the sun off them but they're becoming less common as, as vietnam becomes a little bit more westernized like you mostly see older guys wearing them as sort of a, a bit of a cultural holdover um, so yeah, that was it really. Uh, oh, I should mention actual combat helmets. The only people in North Vietnam you see with combat helmets are either on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, uh, in which case it's either Soviet SSH 40s or East German M56s. You sometimes see those, which is quite strange. NVA wearing NVA. Absolutely, helmets, yeah. It's quite it, interesting. It, it, yeah, it's a uh, Or anti aircraft gun crews in the north would sometimes wear SSH 40s presumably for protection from shrapnel or debris or anything like that because they were likely to get strafed or bombed I suppose. 
Um, otherwise, that's that's it. It's a fairly simple kit. There's not a huge amount of gear. You've got an army that's mostly reliant on, you know, self-propelled transport. They don't have a huge number of trucks other than those on the trails. Uh, they're coming down extreme distances from the north through jungle trails. You don't need to carry a lot. You're going to get really hot, really sick in the jungles if you're carrying too much gear. So the least you can carry, the less you can carry, the better. Uh, and once you get to the south, you're fighting mostly mass infantry battles. There's not a mechanised army really, right until the end stages of the war, when they have Chinese tanks and to a lesser extent either captured or Chinese imported personnel carriers. So yeah, a light, uh, mobile infantry lowdown, really. Thank you very much indeed, Matt. Thank you. So I hope you found it interesting looking at this. Obviously, as I say, there will be further content like this coming up on the channel in the not-too-distant future. If you have found this interesting and you'd like to see more of this sort of thing, please do consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the notification button down below. That will, of course, alert you when I upload future videos. That's everything for this video. Thanks once again, Matt. Thank you. And until next time, bye for now.